Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of the origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Beverly Saylor, the Armington Professor in the Department of Earth, Environmental, and Planetary Science at Case Western Reserve University. Her research is wide-ranging and includes carbon storage in deep aquifers and the sedimentary record of Earth history, environmental change, and the evolution of animal life around the world, from the Lake Erie Basin to the Altiplano of Bolivia to the Afar region of Ethiopia. And tonight she will talk to us about climate, tectonics, and landscape, disentangling influences on human evolution. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Be Beverly Saylor. Thank you, Glenn. I'm glad to be here, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about some work I've been doing over the last um, 15, 17 years, and also that I'm hoping to do, um, well, I will be doing in the future with the recent funding from the, the Keck Foundation. Uh, and it's looking at really the, the local environments, the landscape, the habitats, the topography, the water resources of early human ancestors. Uh, so what I mean by early human ancestors are not necessarily on the direct line of, um, of lineage of, of human species, but just like you might think your great, great, great grandmother's cousin is an ancestor. So closely related lineages are included within that as well. And we'll talk about it at a time prior to the emergence of the human genus, prior to Homo. So the Australopithecines is the main genus at that time. And, uh, and one of the most famous ones, of course, of these Australopithecines is Lucy, uh, who was discovered by CWRU and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History back in the 1970s and um, has for and as you can see her uh, replica of her fossil at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. So we're looking at Lucy's species and her relatives we'll be talking about today. And I said it's not necessarily on a direct lineage, but Lucy's species has been thought of typically to be the most likely direct ancestor to the genus Homo. And that's largely because her species was really the only one that was well known <laughs> until recently. Um, and that has begun to change. So um, what I'm gonna do today, the general outline is that we'll start with sort of framing a problem uh, that, that led to us to get a, a funding for a large interdisciplinary grant to, to answer a question about Lucy and her, and her relatives. And then I'm going to go back and look at work that we did to understand it. Before that, not directly related to that pro problem, but more broadly. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about what we're going to do with that problem. So those are sort of the three parts as we'll be looking at them. So the problem, what we um, our interesting question, it starts with an observation. I talked about Lucy and Hadar and um, Lucy was discovered in the Hadar area of Ethiopia, and this area is most famous for her species. Um, they've got uh, several hundred specimens of her species have been discovered and described many very important ones. The partial skeleton that is Lucy, craniums, uh, wonderful stuff like that. And there's been work there for 50 years and lots of fossils discovered, but only Lucy's species documented from the time period that that she you know that it lived uh, and so that's 50 years of work and a, a nice observation that we have there and then um, maybe 18 years ago I started working with Johannes Haile Selassie and I'm sure you've um, heard from him present at these events before and he started working in the Wurzel Mule project which is near to Hadar only 25 30 kilometers away um, and very rapidly over the past 15 years, there have been numerous discoveries, um, including at the time period when Lucy is well documented at Hart Hadar, uh, there is uh, multiple different species coming out of Lorenzo Mille. So Lucy's species, yes, a closely related but different species. And then also, um, evidence for 
a species, and it hasn't been assigned yet, that walked differently, had a different way of moving than Lucy species, okay? And we know that because they, it had an opposable toe as opposed to just the afarensis. Lucy species is really a, a foot that's much like modern humans. So that's an interesting observation that goes on. And, and from the first discoveries, we have been wondering what is different about Lorenzo Mille. Uh, so just to kind of confirm here, when we talk about them being at the same time, this is just a like really um, document on the left of this slide, it shows between 3.3 and 3.5 million years ago where Lucy species is documented in time, right? And then at Warren Zomile, different species all overlapping very tightly. And we have very tightly constrained age controls on these um, and very close in time to each other. So that's the main point is what is going on so that at the same time, only 25, 30 kilometers apart from each other, do we have only one species in one place and not as many discoveries in terms of number of specimens, but multiple species in another. What is different about Oranzo Mille? So why is there hominin diversity at Oranzo Mille, but not at nearby Hadar? That is sort of the driving question of the research that I'm going to be doing for the next three years. Now to frame that question and kind of understand what we we're thinking, I wanna go back and let, look at the setting of Oranzo Mille and Hadar. Where are they? What are we learning from them? And um, so this is a map of Africa and the Afar region where they are, I didn't even put loose, you know, Hadar and Runza Mule on that because they have so tiny little dots, but they're within this square that represents the Afar region of Ethiopia. And uh, the little red arrows indicate the direction that the continental crust, the land, is moving apart from each other there, right? So the Afar is what we call a triple junction. It's a place where three tectonic plates meet and are moving apart from each other on features we call rif rifts, right? It's rifting apart this land right there. And the rift actually continues down through much of Eastern Africa as the Eastern African rift zone. But here we have two and uh, three of them that meet one has completed and created new ocean floor, the Red Sea, and another one has created the Gulf of Aden Sea, rifting mm -hmm. apart the um, land. So zooming in onto Runza Mille and looking in the Afar about where they are, we see that they are in different places relative to this rift system, and they are therefore different places sort of tectonically, topographically landscape. And this is looking at it today, the topography today. We have to kind of remember that what we see today is not necessarily what was there in the past, but there are some similarities that we can take some um, advantage from it. So, so Hadar, and there's other uh, fossil study areas very near it, is on the Awash River that drains much of the Afar region. It's a large river um, coming through there, right? And was pres is thought to have been present at the time of Lucy species as well, bringing water into there, but it's a, you know, it's a large shallowly draining one. In contrast, we're in the Mille today is located along the Mille River, which drains the highlands, right? This doesn't quite reach up into the highlands. This has a direct path from the highlands of the Ethiopian plateau down to Renzo Mille, right? And to the area where we'll be talking about eventually. Um, and so there's very steep topography near it as opposed to flatter topography. Um, there's also these red areas, arrows are um, stars are volcanic centers. So it's on the line of volcanic centers there and it's close to this rift system. Uh, so it's, a, it's different, even though they're close to each other, they're in different locations within the rift system. Um, and those different topographies influence water, vegetation, vegeta um, topography, landscape, habitat. Uh, and just as uh, I've been mentioning the word rift here, and, um, and so we can kind of look at what that really means a bit, right? So the continent of Africa, the continental crust of Africa, which is the gray and brown in this, is being stretched apart and thinned in this area, right? And when you thin it, then that produced topographic lowlands where that thinning is occurring. You also have upwelling of the red, which is the hot mantle, um, and that can create 
volcanism coming up through. So we have volcanoes. So sometimes it's the volcanism that causes the, the chicken and egg problem, actually, <laughs> what causes what to happen. And then, of course, you have lowlands where the, the rivers and the water accumulate more. So you have even in a dry region, water um, in the in the um, in the lowlands of it. And then here is Hadar and Wurnzamile in slightly different location wise near to each other, but different settings. And so our hypothesis then about what um, is going on here uh, is that even though Warren Zemili and Hadda are close to each other, the reason why they have such different records of, of human early hominin habitation is that there are landscapes and habitats related to their location in the rift system that are different and they're more varied at Wuranza Mule and these supported more diverse habitats and the more diverse habitats supported more diverse mammals, more diverse mammal communities, including the, the early human ancestors, the hominins. How far is that from, from the sea? How far is it from the sea? Uh, a few hundred kilometers. Okay, here we go. Um, are there other hypotheses outside of the tectonic plates, or is this the most pr promising? Are there That's hypotheses the for why there's hominin diversity, or other hypotheses for why there is topography? For the diversity. For diversity, absolutely, there are others. Um, well, first of all, this, this evidence for, for diversity prior to the emergence of Homo, this is the only place where they're so close to each other and it's so well established. So there aren't people thinking about this question. This is our first opportunity to ask this question. So it's a great, you know, we haven't been able to, to do it before because in most, you know, in Hadar, in the Afar, it's, it has been Lucy and her, and her species, right? That's it. So you wouldn't ask this question because we didn't know it was, right? And so in a sense, um, we've been making hypotheses based on this window into early humans, early hominins, which is Hadar. <laughs> and, um, and now in the last 15 years, we've moved and opened another window and it's opening new questions. And so that question is, why are we seeing this diversity? Um, do we have other hypotheses? I mean, we can always, we can always go to preservation. <laughs> Um, you know, human identification, right? People, people are different about how they identify species. There's a, but um, you know, that foot is pretty compelling. Um, so. And are there other places where you, around Africa where, the, where you see such diversity? There are hints of it in places and nowhere is it so close to each other and so much good evidence. This is really the best of it. So, you know, for a long time, it was just Lucy species identified. And then hence, but far apart from each other, uh, you know, hundreds, thousands of kilometers, you know, oh, maybe this is a different species, right? And so those were attributed at the same broad time and they were attributed then to maybe regional variation, right? But in Wurnzamile and Hadar, we have, it can't be, it's not regional variation, right? <laughs> It has to be local variation that's going on. So we can't say, well, they're so far apart from each other and they've just kind of changed a little bit. Now it's like, why are they so different and so close to each other? So Dave Fidel is asking about how dry the area was three million years ago. I mean, how much can you walk there, look at it and say, well, this is what it was like three and a half, you know, three million years ago, whatever it's like today. So um, I'm going to answer that question for you a little bit in the next section. And I'm going to answer that question for a time period, a few hundred thousand years before Lucy and her species, right? Because that's where we've done that study. And then that, that question, right, is the question that we're going to ask and try to answer um, in the future for this with this new study that's founded for the time of Lucy and her species. And when you ask about how dry it was, there's really two parts to that. And that is how dry was it in the region? Were you in a time of regionally dry climate? But regionally dry climate, you can have local areas that are that are not dry, that are wet. Um, and that's really what we're trying to get at. Are there other places, particularly in Wurnzo Mille, where where we had you know different microclimates from from the Hadar area? 
um, because the regional climate is the same no matter no matter you know um, between these two places because they're so close to each other. So that great question because it's really it's where we're going. Great. So we we have a whole bunch of good questions here. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna ask the anonymous question, which was what made you what was the impetus to start looking at Warsano Mille? Oh, so that started by Johannes Haile Selassie, who's the director of the Ronson Mille project. And he um, he had finished, you know, he'd done his PhD and done work there. This is really his story to tell. Um, and so I might get it wrong. But my understanding is then, you know, he um, he was looking for a new place to go. And there had been some work on elephant fossils in around the Warrenzo, what became the Warrenzo Mille area, um, this place called Amato. And that was it. They didn't know much about it other than the elephants were there and maybe some, maybe there were some pig fossils that hinted at an age. So they had some sense of how they were. And then using um, like satellite imagery, you could, he could get a sense of, okay, it looks like there's maybe a lot of um, sediments that are the right age, right, in this area. Um, and, and then you have to get a permit uh, to work in the area. And so he got this permit uh, from the Ethiopian government. The good thing for, for him and us is that Wurnsel Mili is huge. So I'm gonna tell you a lot about a lot, a big area of Wurnsel Mili, and it's actually only a small fraction of it. So we have a lot of work to do there over the next, you know, many, many years. We can keep it going for 50 years like Hanar for sure. From Chris Cullis. So looking at the, topographical record, are the two regions separated by an, an, impen an, an impenetrable barrier? Like, is it hard to get from one to the other? <laughs> Great question. Uh, they aren't now. Uh, it's, it's possible that they were in the past. We don't know that. I, my sense is no. I don't think so. I don't think they were in the past, but that is one of the questions we're going to have. It's not impenetrable. Um, there's not a barrier. And the reason why is that we have... Um, paleo current measurements, right? So you can you can figure out what direction the rivers were flowing. At the time of Lucy, but not earlier, um, the, the rivers were flowing down towards the Hadar Lake. Um, and so they they can't, there can't be an impenetrable barrier if they're going down to the lake and they eventually get there. So so there weren't they, it, it it joined further up river. It joined the the Awash for the, the, the Mille used to join further up up river on the Awash. They um, we don't know where they joined in the um they, it might be further up on the landscape, yes. Uh -huh. Um, but they yes, my thought, and we're still we haven't published this, we still have to demonstrate it, but yes, it seems to me from the evidence that we have that all that in the past, Wurunza Mille and Hadar and the Awash River did were confluent. They merged into the Hadar Lake. But that's one of the questions that needs to be demonstrated. Um, it, it's less clear before Lucy's time that that really happened. Now we're going to go talk about Wurns Amelia, and this is a little bit the most complicated, maybe, <laughs> of the parts of the talk. And I just want to start with sort of showing you a couple photographs of it. And of course, we talked about Johannes Haile Selassie is the director of that project, and he's in the back of this photograph. And it just, you know, we have a, a, the local people, the AFA are the ones that are wearing rifts. And then we also have a lot of assistance from the Highland people um, from, from, uh, uh, from, the, from the Highlands of it. And um, that, so it's a big project that Johannes manages. And I'm fortunate, I just show up and go around, walk around in circles in the field. And that's all I have to do is think. And he has to manage um, everything like uh, vehicles and driving us across rivers when they flood and cooking and feeding us when we're there, or at least hiring people to feed us and keeping everybody happy so they dance. And so um, Johannes does a really great job down there. He really does. Um, so it's always like, you know, great at finding fossils, but there's so much more that's involved in this project that takes a lot of work. So um, it's, it's really important part of it. All right. So now looking at Wurunzo Mille, and this is really just kind of, you know, we've been working mostly along the Mille River. And so what this, this very complicated diagram is showing, right, is a lot of the discoveries that have come out over the last 15 years. All right. And, um, 
and they, they've been important. Uh, three of them have been published, announced in Nature, one in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences of these many of these discoveries that are coming out. So they're, they're a big deal. Um, but rather than go through the history of each discovery, um, I just want to hear show sort of what my aspect of it or the geologists, what we do, and that is really working on putting them into context. And when we first started there, it was like being dropped into Mars. We, we, Like I said, we knew there were some elephants and maybe based on pigs or something, we had some general sense of how old they were and that's it, right? And so we're really working to figure out how they relate to each other in space, age, environment. Uh, and it's a big job. So this, this kind of section at the bottom here is a cross section um, so that the top of it is the topographic profile um, of the land going from northwest to southeast along the Millet River. And the different colored layers, and you don't have to look at them in, in any great detail, they are representing layers of volcanic ash or of volcanic basalt, right? And what's nice about these is we can date them, and that's mostly um, Al Dana with the Berkeley Geochronology Center who does the dating and get an absolute age on them. But we can also chemically identify them. It's like a fingerprint. Um, so that when we see it in one place and then we go to another place and it hasn't been exposed between, we can know that it's the same layer of the same age. It's like taking the landscape at the time and sprinkling it with pink sugar, right? And then you can identify that landscape again. And what this does is it takes this, this stratigraphic succession that is containing the fossils and breaks it up into, into sheets of time, right? Um, and that's really helpful in that we know how old the fossils are relative to each other, even if they're not, you know, in the same sequence. Um, but also when we look within that, those time layers, right, we can begin to say, okay, we have lake deposits over here and river deposits over here and, and whatever, paleo soils over here. And we can sort of, because we have them in time horizons, we can piece them together to make a map of what, of what it looked like at that time. If we don't have those time horizons, we don't, we don't really know, right, that this lake was really next to this particular river deposit or a different one. So they're important for reconstructing the habitat, the environment, um, these, these horizons. So the, the main thing to get it here also, the next thing is that, so these layers, because layers are stacked on top of each other with younger on top of older, right, um, and these are tilted down to the to the east or to the right, um, so that the oldest layers, and this tilting, this, uh, that's a vertical exaggeration, so they're not as tilted as they look. Um, the oldest layers are on the ruins of Millet or over in the Northwest, and progressively younger layers are stacked on top of them like a deck of cards over to this area in the Southeast. This is where Lucy and her species are discovered, and this over here is where older, um, fossils, Lucy's ancestor, Anamensis, um, are discovered. This is another way to look at that same story here, um, which is now this is instead of a cross section, it's a map. Here's the, we see in blue, the Millet River. We see um, the volcanoes, we're in some Millets between these volcanoes. Um, and then the the purple and red lines are indicating just some of the layers that we have mapped out in there. These are layers of volcanic basalt that, that break it up into these slices. And over here in this box, we're gonna to return to this box um, in, the, in the last section, that's where we're gonna talk about Lucy and her species and the stars indicate different species. And you see in this box, there's a lot of diversity of, um, of species found. But, for the rest of this section, I'm gonna talk actually about this blue star over here where we've found the oldest uh, fossil we've described so far, um, which is a cranium of uh, Astropithecus anamensis, which is the ancestor to, um, to Lucy species. And so what I look here, we're just looking at a, at a photograph just to get a sense of what it looks like in there and very, um, you know, this, this is looking at this landscape over there on the left is basalt, on the right are layers of volcanic ash, that's the white, and between them layers of sediment deposited in rivers and small ponds that we see evidence for, okay? Um, and they're, what's, they're separated by each other. We don't normally see sort of 
context like that, um, there's a fault there, right? And what's kind of interesting about this is that these over here, if we look at this, here's the fault in this little cartoon, right? And then different layers of volcanic ash, maybe the basalt at the bottom, we see that, and then some volcanic ash on top of it. And what we can see here, actually, when you really get out and you look at it, um, is that there's a th great thickness um, on, the, on the downside of the fault, and these volcanic ash layers are, are really stacked right on top of each other in, on the upside. And that's really evidence that this fault was active and moving while deposition was occurring. It was creating topography um, in that area. And that topography, we see evidence for lakes in here, right, is creating a low spot where we have lakes, lakes economy. So this tectonically active area is shaping, shaping the landscape, really um, controlling where water is, the micro habitats of there. Um, this next image I'm going to show you is going to be underneath this basalt and further here to the north, okay, towards, towards one of these, um, not very far, just beyond this little hill, okay? So now we're looking beneath that basalt, but we can map it. It's the same one we know where it is. And this is where this, um, this, this cranium was discovered. It was kind of at the very top of these brownish layers. And you can see there's some tilting in the layers themselves. And this isn't tectonic. They haven't been tilted after deposition. They were deposited at an angle. And they were deposited by this very typical of a, of a river delta deposits. The river comes in, dumps its sand out when it hits the, um, the lake. And then they just kind of build out in sort of dipping or tilted layers, OK? Uh, that you can, as we talked about paleo currents, you can get the sense of the direction of the flow. So this is evidence. There's a big, a pretty large river coming in into a lake, and this is where this fossil was found. So it's probably living, you know, on the river by the lake somewhere like that. And um, here's the lobes. We can see in a larger, you know, picture the lobes of this delta are present, and they're discontinuous, which is what delta lobes do. Um, and then after deposition. It was, it was overlain by a layer of volcanic ash that allows us to date the fossil and by additional layers of basalt as well. Again, so it's, we can use that to date it, but also again, there's this landscape that's being influenced by volcanism, by faulting, it's creating places for water to accumulate. Uh, and that just gives us a sense of how this tectonic setting is, is really influencing the habitat. So then we ask, well, what about climate? What's going on here? And we can get that out of the same study. And these are my colleague, Doris Barboni, and her student, uh, Benjamin Borrell, worked on this, looking at, at and other students, uh, you know, as well, other um, colleagues on this, looking at the um, remains of plant matter in that, okay? And their physical and chemical properties tell us about climate, both local, you know, the ones that aren't transported for, and regional, some of which, you know, are transported and record the entire catchment. And so there's, you know, pollen in there. These are at 10 micron scale bars, diatoms, uh, which are single-celled algae and a sponge spicule. Uh, these are diatoms, sorry. These are phytoliths, that's a typo. Um, and so these are all telling us a little bit about, about the environment. And then there's ones that aren't as photogenic, but it's leaf wax, right? And it doesn't, you're not gonna take a picture of it, but you can, my, um, my colleague um, measures the, the isotopes about, and that tells about sort of the vegetation, what kind of vegetation was, and also the um, hydrology, the climate, the, the, in there, the temperature and whatnot. So these are very powerful tools. And this, these are coming from within the layer where the hominin fossil was discovered. Okay, so put it together, this is a complicated figure, um, but just kind of shows how we work, you know, to put together um, the geology, right, the sediments themselves and the character of those with these other kinds of evidence coming from the micro properties of, of the plant matter um, or uh, other attributes within it. And so this, we interpreted these sediments that contain the fossil uh, to be the deposits of a delta. And we're showing this um, here. This is looking down on the delta on the top of it. And then it makes this as a cross section, both you know, as it's building out and then also 
you know, forming through a lobe itself where it's thick and then thins as we looked at. And so just to give you a picture of a modern one, this is a delta feeding into Lake Turkana in Kenya, right? And you see the green is lots of vegetation. It's a, it's a more vegetated area than the drier parts on the side because you have the river coming through and feeding, providing water in the floodplains of it, right? To support that area. So this is what we're thinking is going on is there's a delta feeding into a relatively deep lake. And we know how deep it was because it has to be at least as deep as the thickness of those, um, those delta layers coming down. And then these, this is just a summary of what the pollen data are showing in this pie um, chart. And um, from, again, from the layer where the hominin fossil was found, not, um, not throughout the whole section. And it shows, you, you know, that it was a mixture <laughs> of things, but a lot of it was wooded. Um, and then some month, some steps, so, you know, shrubby and wooded, this combination going there. And there's some montane forest. And I think that part's actually really pretty cool and exciting because some of the pollen there is only found today above 4,000 meters, right? Now, things are different in the past with higher CO2. And so maybe it could, you know, we don't know for sure. But, um, but that does suggest, right, that this river um, that is at the foot of this Ethiopian plateau in that time also was receiving water from the highlands of the Ethiopian plateau, right? And so this idea that you have, you know, rainfall, it's, it's a real direct route of rainfall on the highlands to this, to this area where the hominin was found. So then looking at the leaf wax, which is this last part over here, and this is not just from the layer of the hominin, but the, there's, it's from layers beneath it where there are lake deposits, clays, and then we call it pro-delta deposits. So there are silts that are just in front of the main delta and then the sands and gravels that make up the delta itself. And, um, and we, Sarah measured um, carbon isotopes and deuterium, hy uh, hydrogen isotopes on the leaf wax in there. And it's, I'm not gonna go into the combination of the two, but they, they together, it's important to measure them together. They provide insight into sort of what the vegetation was and whether it was dry or wet. Um, and we see heat from this, you know, there's intervals that were uh, shrubby grass and pretty dry. Um, and even some was really arid. Um, but at the time of the hominin, the stuff is indicating, you know, mixed woodland, so pretty wet um, in this local environment. But you tie it together and you can look at this because we have the age control cut fairly well. Um, and this agrees pretty well with um, deep sea cores where you get the regional climate and the, the broad regional climate was pretty arid. Okay, so what we have is a local body of water fed by a river that's streaming from the highlands of the Ethiopian plateau, bringing a lot of water to an area during a time when the regional climate was dry. And this is how this tectonic setting is influencing the local microclimate and microhabitats. Anonymous asks again, I didn't know what, that we could see where rivers used to be. Very cool. Why can we tell, only tell up to a certain time on the history of water running? So you, I think you mentioned that you could, you can only look back so far in the rivers you had there. Is that something specific about those rivers? I think I may have misspoken um, because it, you can see. Yeah, I think I was trying to make a distinction, and it's a bit confusing, right? Because I'm telling you a lot about an aspect of time here. Um, a part of Warren's Emily that's older than where we have Lucy and her species living with others, right? And I'm just, I was trying not to confuse you, <laughs> but apparently I added more confusion with that. So I, there's nothing that stops us from knowing where the rivers were or when they were flowing or where they were flowing. Um, I've done that, you know, in 13 million year old sediments in Bolivia and 550 million year old sediments in Namibia. Um, there's, there's nothing about it, um, you know, except that, so that, yeah, I confused you, I apologize. So how, how, do, how can you, how do you tell? Which way the rivers are flowing? Yeah. Where they are. So the you, first thing you wanna know where the rivers are, um, and we often identify those by looking for channels, right? You'll see layers and then you'll have uh, an erosion surface that cuts through it. 
Um, and, and then that will be filled in. And you can see truncation. Uh, geology is about cross-cutting relationships. Um, and so one cuts across the other and you can map out those channels. And we will be doing that. Sometimes you don't have nicely developed channels or the channels are so large that you can't match them, but that's a big part of it. And then when, when water flows and transports sand, um, and this is like, physicists love this. They do a lot of studies about how it creates these instabilities and creates what we call bed forms. Um, and those bed forms will look like waves. You'll see them on the beach, ripples, right? Um, and so, and they, if there's a current particularly, those, those sand move and wait, they go up on one side and tripped on the other. Right. And so they're just progressively moving. And so you can you can reconstruct from what's left of those ripples, the bed form preserved, what the flow direction was. Is this a period that's long enough that you can see how the waters are running, changing because of the tectonic shifts? Well, that's a great question. So so in that delta deposit, right, we could see there were two different directions of flow. And that's just local. Right. That's just the. Um, local migration of those channels and changing where they're going, right? You know, the channel goes like this and one time and then it switches over and goes like this and we have different local flow directions. But what's kind of interesting is that this area in the Northwest that's older, most of the paleo current directions, right? The flow directions that we measure are going towards the North. Um, and when we come over towards the Southeast where um, Lucy and her cousins are were living right there. Now they've switched to the east, right? And so one of the questions that we ultimately will answer, <laughs> and that is not actually you know directly part of this project that I'm talking about next, but is important to it, is what caused that shift? Uh, what's going on with that? So yes, I do think there's there's a transformation in the tectonic setting that's going on um, from based on the on these paleo flow directions. So uh, Kate, that's a perfect lead into Kate's, Kate Caforio's question. So based on how the tectonic plate movement has been observed and layers shifted, do you think it's possible that there are other bones that were destroyed by this movement that are older than the cranium that, that was found? So yes, so an important part to remember is that um, so much of paleontology and geology is what's actually preserved. We only see a tiny fraction of what was actually there. So for a long time, right, you know, we the, the most important fossil search areas um, for these pre-homo, uh, you know, early human ancestors are in the African Rift Valley. And you could ask, is that because they only lived in the African Rift Valleys? And the answer is no. <laughs> It's because they're best preserved in the African Rift Valleys. And we know that for sure because there have now been discoveries outside of those African Rift Valleys of fossils of early human ancestors, just not as many of them. So absolutely, there may, there could be, and um, you know, earlier, earlier ancestors um, if you go to older layers. We have, I think we're just about the oldest that we'll find along the Millet River exposures. Um, but like I said, the Warrens of Millie project is quite large and there are areas where Johannes has fossils that are older and much, much younger as well. So there's a long record there of fossils that's, you know, for future work to figure out. So you've mentioned hominins, you've mentioned elephants, you've mentioned pigs, but you have rivers and any fossils from the marine life? Not marine, but fish and crocodiles. Um, are, are pretty common there. Hippos. We started this with, you know, well, we ended the first section on why is there a hominin diversity at Wurunza Mille than there is at Hadar. And that's what I'm going to talk about um, today. And this, this last part. And really it's, um, it's, there's not a lot of new data here. There's not a lot of even old data here. This is really future looking, what we're going to do. Um, this intriguing question that, that we have and just sort of, sort of, Reiterate what the question is, right? The um, the map on the top left shows Runza Mille. It shows the Mille River exposures. It shows lots of different species um, in there. The greens are Lucy species. Um, the blue is this cranium and immensus, the ancestor to Lucy species. 
the pink and orange are, um, you know, the orange is a, is a different species, Deiramida, which is closely related to um, Lucy's species, and the pink are, um, they can't be placed within, they haven't been placed yet, even within the, um, the genus level, okay? And uh, the yellow star is, uh, is you know, just, uh, it's, it's the first really discoveries that were published and they were sort of not great places, but they were kind of like Anamensis and kind of like Afarensis and, and whatnot. And so now it's back up to, it's, you know, it has to be thought about in terms of light of all these discoveries that we have with there. So there's lots of different species and particularly now I want to draw your attention to the, to the black square. And these are where these species are living together at the same time, right? So in the, in the top left, they're older, but these are all very close within 20,000 years, um, the, same, the same age. Um, and that black square in Wurz Amelie corresponds an area approximately to the lower right um, image, which is from Hadar. Right, so the area of this black square at Wurns Amelie is it the same about as all of Hadar, okay, or at least the main area of Hadar, and so um, it took a sense of how big Wurns Amelie really is, um, and then just draw your attention to you know it's been studied for forty years, and all the green stars are lots of Lucy species, but but nothing else. So why is there this hominin diversity along the Mille River? And yet when you come down to the Awash River, um, there really isn't. And this gets back to what I said in the answer to the questions, you know, um, the Hadar has been studied for 40 years, 50 years, it's been this like lens into early human evolution. Um, and it's given us one window into it, right? Uh, about where Lucy and her species lived, that Lucy was maybe alone, the only one, the only possible ancestor to Homo, right? All of these kinds of ideas coming out of uh, out of Hadar by itself uh, in isolation, and then now we we go to a just nearby but slightly tectonically different um, setting, and now it, it's it's a whole new window, and it brings into all sorts of new questions about what's going on, right? And so this question about why is there hominid diversity is really has many leaps and bounds to it, different places to go um, with it. And then our hypothesis, right? We, I, I talked about this before, is that, you know, Rosabile is, is more in a different tectonic setting um, and that created more niches that could support more diversity of mammals, mammal communities and, and hominins and early human ancestors. So just to break that down, Right. The idea is that the landscape of Lorenzo Mille, which is created by tectonics, by volcanism, by climate, by hydrology, by rivers, whatnot. Um, so over here, Lorenzo Mille is, is different from the, um, the landscape of Hadar, which is on the rift floor. Right. And so which is flatter and, and lacking the volcanic influences, maybe not as tectonically act active there. Uh, not as you know, fault um, and has this larger river uh, traveling through it, right? Um, and so, then the idea is that that landscape created different habitats, primarily vegetation, but also water resources. There, um, you can think of many reasons for it. Some is how does water influence vegetation, but even soil, right? The composition of your soil, how does that influence the vegetation that's there? Or habitat, if you think of it in terms of places to hide, right? If you're in a topographically complex area, there's more places to hide than it may be a flat landscape. So there's. You know, there's lots of different ways um, that these two can work together um, to influence the mammals then that would live in an area, right? And so that's the that idea then next of these work together that influence the mammalian communities, including the hominin species that lived in the area. So that's the broad idea um, that's going on in order to um, address that, right? We need really uh, to systematically integrate <laughs> these three different ways of studying, you need to study the mammals, you need to study the habitat, you need to study the landscape. Um, and that's really uh, what we propose to do to the WM Keck Foundation um, with this question, right? This idea that, that we wanna understand why there's more diversity at Wernsemilly than Hadar, 
or another way to answer that, to ask that question is, you know, how is tectonics influencing diversity and also then evolution of hominins, right? Um, and so, you know, what, what we have then is this really this unprecedented opportunity. This has not been found where you have diversity in one place and only one species in another, all so close to each other. There are, it, it's, this is new. This is a big deal, right? You can't even ask the question that we're asking before these discoveries were made because we had instead this lens that it's, it's Lucy species or maybe it's another one, but they're very far from each other. Um, some other things that go on. So we have these new discoveries, right? For Moranzo Mille that gave us this opportunity, but also that had our this decades and decades of research, um, which has produced a tens of thousands, everyone's Amelia and Hatter both have tens of thousands of, of mammal fossils, right, have been collected, right? So we don't have to limit our questions to just the hominins, which are really cool, but now with mammal fossils, you can really ask questions about, about you know, communities that are living together in diversity in real ways. Um, but also, you know, we, with, with so many um, species of Lucy, so many samples of it, it's a pretty good idea that it's not, it's not, um, you know, that you've only collected a few, right? It really is not something else there or it hasn't been recognized um, anyway. And then we also have what made this, you know, really work, we have a great team um, and a lot of work, this is again, Johannes, like a lot of work has gone into the people at Hadar and the people at Winsor Millie were not able to visit each other's sites before. Um, there was just, you know, history and politics and tradition, the different, the different uh, field areas in Ethiopia did not share a lot of information. And over the last decade, there's a lot of been work been put into sort of making it, figuring out protocols and ways to share information and to work together. And then we have new environmental tools. So some of those I talked to you about, like you're looking at leaf wax, right, to get it, and hydrology and climate, um, both local and regional. Um, and so, all of these pulled together to sort of define a new question that had not we hadn't been able to ask before <laughs> and then be able to answer that question, right? At least we think we can. Um, and so we're really excited and grateful to the WM Keck Foundation for, for awarding this grant um, to us. And it's a big project with a lot of people um, involved and we're really excited to be doing it. So I'm just gonna take you through our our approach a little bit. And again, we haven't done this yet. This is what we're planning to do. So we're systematic integration of the new data that we're gonna go in and gather using sort of standard approaches that runs Amelia and at Hadar, um, and also with existing data, right? We have to recalibrate the data that exists so that we can compare these two areas. Um, and we're gonna do it at, at select sites for the most part where we can study both the landscape, the L, the habitat with H and the mammals indicated by M, right? So the landscape is we'll look at the river deposits and these things, things that says facies, right? That, that might be a river channel, facies A, and soil is where the river channel is no longer active and the landscape is stable for a period of time, right? So you can find where there's active deposition going on, where it's not going. Here is a big um, channel body up here in this top face you see, right? And identify these ones, standardize them between where it's a million had our, so we are identifying our local water, you know, our local um, features similarly and map them out um, as we do it. And then within those facies, now we know, you know, this is a river deposit, this is a soil deposit, this is a small river deposit, this is a lake deposit. Um, really go in and these blue you know squares and, and diamonds are representing uh different kinds of analyses chemical biological analyses that would be done to reconstruct what that so looking at the leaf wax you can look at carbonate minerals which might tell you about um, the plants that are right in that soil um, I have a colleague that I work with in Bolivia who's going to be looking at just the bulk geochemistry of the soils, the chemistry, the uh, minerals in them, and at the, um, the burrows of um, invertebrates in them that can tell you about sort of how wet or dry it was and was it seasonal precipitation going on or not. A lot, was there a lot of organic matter? And then also you've got the, um, the people studying these, these 
mammal fossils, right? Um, and really comparing them in terms of what, what species are present, how are they distributed across the landscape, how are they varying locally within Rhodes and Mille and uh, between Rhodes and Mille and Hadar. Uh, and so that's our approach. So just breaking it into the, the group that is studying the, the mammals um, and reconstructing their habitats. And these are sort of the different groups who are doing that using kind of taphonomy is, okay, how, what's the preservation? How is that affected, right? Are we getting an unbiased sample? Um, what can we do from looking at the different features of the animals that are there. What does that tell us about the environment? Was it wooded? Are they, are they adapted to wooded environments? Um, looking at the, the teeth of the fossils, or the, what were they eating? And are they eating what they are physically adapted to? Or are they eating what's there, right? So you might have something that's um, adapted to open area, right, based on its legs. <laughs> and yet it's eating lots of wooded vegetation. So it's not eating what it's adapted to, right? And uh, and then Johannes and this um, just identifying these 30,000 specimens so that you actually know <laughs> what species they are, right? So it's a lot of work and that we're everybody's in agreement on that. Uh, and then same, you know, looking at these um at the at the 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 evidence for habitat, right? The the vegetation that's there, the water that's there, the local, the local water and the regional water, right? Um, and this is we. This, I won't go into as much depth because we've kind of gone over it. But yeah, looking at the the pollen and the phytoliths, looking at the organic matter, the leaf wax in there. We didn't talk about the soils as much because there weren't any preserved soils at the at the previous one, but there are in this area. So there's a lot that you can do with the soils themselves to get at you know what was growing in that area and also what's coming into this catchment area. So lots of this kind of work to reconstruct um, local and regional climate hydrology. Um, and then the, what, what I do more is sort of looking at um, the landscape, right? That's, that's the substrate to the mammals and to the habitat. Um, and so, we, you know, these questions that we've talked about, where are the river bodies? Where are the lakes? How are they related to faults? What is volcanism doing in terms of controlling those or influencing where things are? Um, you know, we have st we still have questions about ages of things and how they relate to each other. This question about when you know when the river switch from north to east <laughs> can be answered, but it takes sort of going up to this area where we haven't had any time to work so far. So a lot of questions in there. Um, and where are the sediments coming from? Are they coming from this this highlands? Are they coming locally? All of this will work together to tell us about sort of um, how. Warren's Amelia and Hadar differ in terms of um, hydrology, vegetation, landscape, and mammal community. And so then in the end, we need to kind of put them all together. This is, this is a synthesis slide, right? The, that the fragmented landscapes create heterogeneous habitats that support greater biological diversity. And so we'd like to really be able to reconstruct and so just imagine they might be wrong. Oh, maybe Warren's Amelia looks like this and Hatter looks like this, or maybe Warren's Amelia is more varied within there. And so that's the picture we wanna, we wanna work. And the last part of bringing it all together is with my colleague here at Case Western Reserve University, which is Jeffrey Yaris, and he's a geostatistician. Um, and so to take the bits of data that we have from disparate parts and, and model how they relate to each other um, in space and time, and therefore really ask questions about, you know, are they demonstrably more heterogeneous at Wernsen Millie than at Hadar? Um, and this has you know, important implications, not just for um, understanding the role of regional tectonics on human evolution and diversity, but just more broadly, habitat fragmentation and biodiversity generally, and also just really how we became human, who our ancestors are. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.